Church, let's grab our Bibles. We're in Revelation 19 today. We're starting a new chapter. Let's go ahead and stand up for the presence of the reading of the Word of God as we recognize that these holy scriptures are infallible. They are inerrant. They are the inspired word of the only true and living God. Listen now to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to read verses 1 to 5 together this morning for our text. Here is the word of the Lord. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her, her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. I remember when I was in seminary, I had the, um, the assignment to read some, somebody outside of the Reformed tradition. Uh, we were asked to read one of the mystical writers. Now, this is not my specialty or my interest. I'm usually right down Reformed Road. I'm, I like to stay on Reformation Boulevard as far as all my reading goes. But we were asked to read one of the mystical writers. And so I chose Julian of, of Norwich, who you may know is the earliest female writer in the English language, which is one of the reasons why I chose to read her. It goes back all the way to the 1300s. Julian lived during the time of the Black Death plagues, and so that alone kind of piqued my curiosity and interest. I thought that might be, might be kind of neat. She was an anchorite, and if you don't know that word, it's, it's something like a nun whose whole life is devoted to prayer. She stayed most of her adult life in one room trying to pray and to read scripture and to experience the presence of God. And she herself, she went through a number of severe illnesses, which may have, in fact, impacted some of the things that she thought that she was seeing in terms of her visions. And so her writing is called The Showings, in which she writes down some of these visionary experiences that she has as one who's trying to commune with God in the best way that she knows how. So in The Showings, and this is the part that I remember, I haven't read it for years, She has all these visions of Christ. She sees Christ bleeding on the cross, for instance, some very dramatic visions of of the person of Christ. But then probably in her best-known vision, it's called her hazelnut vision, she sees the whole world, the whole universe, as something like the size of a hazelnut in the hands of the true and almighty God, the living Lord, the creator of all things. And it's there in this hazelnut vision that she says her famous words, and if you've known anything from Julian of Norwich, this is probably what you know. She says, And all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. That's her most famous line. And I want you to just think about that this morning. Now, I don't agree with Julian of Norwich and all that she says. Again, most of my reading and study is just right down the Reformers and the Puritans and things like that. Definitely outside of my interest. But let me ask you this. Is she right about that? Is she right in saying that at the end of all things, all is going to be well, all manner of things is going to be well? Well, I think she is. And it's hard to believe it because we look out at a world that is obviously in turmoil and chaos, especially today, especially in our own times. But it's sort of always been that way. There's always chaos and turmoil. And so what believing Christians have done again and again is we've gone to the promises of God in the Holy Scriptures in which he himself does promise to us that at the end of all things, he's going to bring all of this broken, messed up world that we live in to a state of rightness and fitness and righteousness and justice. He is going to do that. That's part of why Revelation chapter 19 is in our Bibles, to remind us of the goodness and the justice and the eternal righteousness of God. So this morning, again, have your Bible out with me, please, as we go through this. We're starting a new chapter, and man, are we close to finishing up the book of Revelation. We're closer to the end than when we started. It's been a while now we've been in this book. We, we just finished chapter 18, which, as you probably recall, is comprised of seven laments pertaining to the fall of Babylon. We've described Babylon 
as that unbelieving world system of unbelief with various manifestations throughout the ages. God is going to judge Babylon, that wicked prostitute. And in chapter 19, we see something that is by and large much more joyful than what we've been looking at in the previous chapters. I think you're going to see that. In Revelation 19, John starts out, After this I heard what seemed to be a loud voice. Now remember, whenever John says, After this... He's describing the order in which he has received and perceived these visionary revelations of God. True revelatory experiences, by the way. I don't know what happened with Julian, but this is a true revelatory experience that John writes down as Holy Scripture for us. And I want you to notice just a couple of differences between chapter 19 and chapter 18. First of all, there are songs in both of these chapters, but in chapter 19, we're going to see four songs rather than seven, and all of these are going to be from the perspective of one who is glorifying and is rejoicing in the power and the goodness of Almighty God. And so that's a little bit different from chapter 18 because we did hear quite a bit from an unbelieving perspective in chapter 18. Here, though, we're going to see much of the glory and the greatness and the sweetness of God. In fact, Chapter 19 is kind of framed on, if we're looking for a structure for this chapter, there are four hallelujahs in this chapter upon which it is built structurally. We're going to look at three of those four hallelujahs today as we work through this. Now, we're going to stop at the third because tomorrow, or I'm sorry, next Lord's Day, we're going to cover the whole of this beautiful text, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I do want to say just one more thing by way of preface this morning, though, that chapter 19 is kind of neatly divided in half between what John hears in terms of these four hallelujahs and what he sees. And we're going to come to the seeing part a little bit later, some of the most difficult sections in the whole book of Revelation as we look at the rider on the white horse and then bleeding into chapter 20, the thousand years. All of that is to come and we're going to work through that when we get there. All right? So today our task is fairly simple. We're going to work on three of these four hallelujahs from Revelation chapter 19. So if you're making an outline there's your bullet points, hallelujah one, hallelujah two, hallelujah three, and we're going to save the fourth one for next week. Everybody with me? We're all on the same page here? Great. All right, so Bible's open. Let's dig into the first hallelujah. It's in verse one. Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments and his, I'm sorry, for his judgments are true and just. So this is what he hears. He hears this. Remember, this is an auditory revelatory experience here. He hears the, vo- the loud voice of a great multitude. Now, we've seen the, the great multitude before. In fact, it's been a while, but let's flip back real quick, shall we, to Revelation chapter 7, where I think he's describing the same great multitude. Revelation 7, 9 says this, after this I looked and behold I, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all the tribes, the peoples, the languages. So here is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Here's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant, all of the promises of God. He sees all of these people gathered before the Lamb. And what are they doing there back in Revelation 7? They're praising God. Look at verse 10 of chapter 7. Crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Very similar language to what we have here today in Revelation chapter 19. Okay? Now, trivia question. If I were to ask you how many times is the word hallelujah in the New Testament, what would you say? Throw out a number for me real quick. A hundred times, yeah. Uh, 25 times, 50 times. What would you think? A lot? A lot? Four times in the New Testament, that's it. I was surprised at that as well. All four of them right here in Revelation chapter 19. Our hymnal has the word hallelujah far more than our New Testaments. I find that interesting. We sing hallelujahs to God. What does that word mean, though? If you know the word hallelujah, you speak three languages because you know English, you know a little bit of Greek, and now you know a little bit of Hebrew. Because the word hallelujah here is a a Greek Hebraism. It's in the Greek. He's writing in Greek. But it's a Hebrew word that goes back primarily to the Psalms. And the word is an interesting word. It's a beautiful word, hallelujah, because it breaks down to two constituent parts. You have the the imperative, hallel, which means to praise. It's actually a call to praise. It's It's in the imperative. He's commanding you. He's demanding. He's expecting you to praise. Hallel, yah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord or Jehovah. Yah 
is sort of an, an abbreviated version of the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah. So when you hear the word hallelujah, it's in an imperative mode, commanding and expecting of you that you're going to join in with all of the saints praising and giving thanks to God. Interestingly, that root word halal actually is similar to the word of like light bursting forth. Okay. So what we're picturing here is the people of God dramatically united. We are bursting forth like light bursts out in the darkness, praising and thanking God for all that he's done. Now, what are we hallelujah in here for in this text? Well, he gives us a number of reasons that we're going to praise God. We're only going to cover a bit of them today. Hallelujah. Why? Salvation and power and glory belong to our God. Pause right there. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. We could probably go on all day long with that, couldn't we? We could say salvation and glory and power and might and justice and eternality and goodness and kindness. We could just make a no- we could just go on for infinity long declaring and exalting God for all of his greatness here, just like the saints are in heaven. But we're just going to look at the word salvation for just a minute, because this is Christian basics, 101 here. What does the word salvation mean, Gospel Fellowship? What does it mean? Salvation is a state of having been saved, right? If you are in a state of salvation this morning, and I trust that most of you are, you are in a state of having been saved. By whom? By Christ. By the Lamb. Saved from what? R.C. Sproul's great question. Saved from yourself, for one thing. Saved from hell. Saved from the devil. Saved from your sin. Saved from your shame. Saved from your guilt. Saved from Babylon. Saved from the demonic deceptions of the prostitute. By the way, whose smoke is rising in the background. Can you smell it? And so here we are. We are rejoicing in the fact, Christian believers speaking to you, that we are in a current state of having been saved by the righteousness of a Savior who died for us on the cross. This is the good news of the gospel. This is why we will be praising him forever and ever in heaven. And by the way, before we move on, um, I just want to comment. If you are saved in Christ today by the blood of the Lamb, then your salvation is secure no matter what happens in this woe-be-gone world. Right? Because every time I look at the news, just like you do, my anxiety level is rising up lately. My blood pressure's rising up a little bit lately when I look at the news. When I see the headlines, my stress factor is rising up a little bit lately. And these are the times when the world gets a little bit crazy, where we look to the Scriptures and we are reminded that we are standing currently now in a state of having been saved from out of all of these things, yes? And so no matter what happens in the headlines, today or tomorrow, believer, if you are in a state of salvation, your salvation is so secure that nothing that happens in the headlines tomorrow can take that away from you. I need you to know that. I need you to trust in that. Okay? I need you to be confident in the fact that whether war breaks out, whether war spills across international boundaries, whether the economy collapses, whether your personal life goes awry, no matter what happens to you, either now or later on in your life, you are secure in the grip of his almighty grace. And for that reason alone, you can give thanks and praise to God. Now, we could probably talk all morning long about what salvation and glory and power means, but I'm just going to pause right there and move on to the next, because this verse does get a little bit darker, a little bit darker. Okay, So let's go on in verse 1 to this next line here. And by the way, verse 2 has to be the most contemporary, relevant verse in our text today. Look at, I'm going to show you why. Watch this. Look at verse 2. For his judgments are true and just, For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has, here we go, avenged on her the blood of his servants. Why is this the most contemporary verse in our passage today? I'll tell you why. Because everything that is happening in the world in this particular moment is a misapprehension of the word 
avenged. What, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? Well, if you have a faulty theology of how vengeance works, not your personal, well, yeah, your personal life is going to be a disaster, okay? Because you are going to get stuck always in this cycle of retributive vengeance with everybody in your life. This is how people's lives get seriously messed up, okay? They don't understand how the vengeance of God works. Now, what's interesting about vengeance is if you don't understand a, a, a theology of divine avenging, not only will you wreck your life and your relationships with all, everybody all around you, you can destroy your family. No, no question about that. You ever see a family get messed up because they don't understand how vengeance, div- divine vengeance works? How about a nation? Can a nation get imperiled by a misunderstanding of divine vengeance? Yes. How about the world situation in which we are in currently right now? Do you think, reason with me, that some of our global problems are taking place even right now because we don't understand a theology of divine vengeance? I think so. Let me explain how the cycle of vengeance works. Okay? Uh, this is why the Wyodani tribes in South America speared each other to death multiple times. This is why Israel is currently in a, in a state of war with Hamas. No question in my mind. This is why the Hutus and the Tutsis destroyed each other in Rwanda. Okay? This is why gang violence spills out in the cities. It's all because of a misunderstanding of divine vengeance. So here's how the cycle works. Violent act takes place. Okay? Wicked, disgusting, heinous. We live in a broken world. And so what happens when a, when a violent act breaks out? Well, well, the other party, they swell with fury. They swell with anger. They swell with cries for justice, yes? And so what happens when this fury get, uh, takes a hold of a human heart or a nation or a tribe or a clan or a family? Well, that fury spills out into rage and anger, and that builds up to threats. And then those threats turn back into what? Well, we're going to seek vengeance in this life now. And so they do that. They, they carry out an, another act of retributive vengeance, yes? And then that only causes the first party. You'd think right now we'd be at a tooth for a tooth, but it never works that way. You'd think that one act of violence with retribution of another act of violence would, would bring out some sort of parallelism or some sort of equilibrium in the situation. Never works that way. Okay? Violence begets violence, begets more violence, begets further escalation. That's how nations destroy each other. That's exactly what's happening right now. Don't get caught in this cycle in your personal life. You'll wreck things, trust me. All of this is a misapprehension of the, the doctrine of divine vengeance. And there's only two ways to break this cycle. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? There's only two ways that the cycle can be broken. Do you know what they are? One, the cross of Calvary intervenes. And praise God, this does sometimes happen. Usually not on national scales, but in personal scales. When the cross of Calvary intervenes in the human heart, the cycle of vengeance is finally broken. Example, have you ever seen, I'm sure you have, a courtroom situation in which somebody has been murdered, somebody has been wronged, somebody has been seriously aggrieved, and what happens? In the sentencing phase, when some of the victims are allowed to come to the microphone and testify, sometimes a victim will actually testify as to their faith in Jesus Christ, and they will say, this is why I have the power to forgive you who have been convicted rightly and justly of this crime. Have you ever seen something like that ever happen before? Isn't that powerful? It just melts the courtroom. And it has the power to finally break that cycle of violence. Now, does it happen on the national or tribal or, or clan scale? Very infrequently, yes. But sometimes, sometimes it does. Sometimes the gospel itself breaks the cycle of vengeance. But, unfortunately, what happens is most of the time it doesn't work like that. 
Most of the time, what happens is that cycle of vengeance continues to escalate such that one will finally destroy the other with sheer, unmitigated violence. And that is a terrible thing when that happens in history. But it does happen. But, but that's not the second way that the cycle is broken. The first is through the cross of Calvary. But the second way that the cycle is broken is right here in your text. You're looking at it. Look more carefully at this verse. Verse 2. For his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Either, either the cross will break the cycle or the very judgment throne of God will do it. And when God breaks the cycle of vengeance, it's because he is bringing ultimate final judgment to the world and woe to that person who experiences the judgment of a holy and righteous God. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yes. Okay, so that's the first hallelujah that we hear. It's, it's a difficult one, I admit. Okay, It's a praise, but not without some difficulty. Now let's go on, let's shift gears here. Hit the clutch and shift. We're going to go to the second hallelujah, which I think, if the first one was actually the most relevant for our time, this one is a bit emotionally difficult, even for believers, especially if we're going to try to be fair to what this text is saying without glossing over it. So look at the second hallelujah. Now we're in verse 3. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Is that not emotionally difficult language? I think it is. I, I struggled with this. Why is it emotionally difficult? Well, because if you're fair to what the text is actually saying, and look at it with your own eyes, tell me if I'm wrong, it looks like the saints are rejoicing in the eternal destruction of those who are lost to hell. Is that not what it's saying? Once more, they cried out, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Ha question, how is that not the same kind of hate that we just talked about under point one? Are we then guilty of the same kind of undying hatred for the other? Is that what's happening here? Well, I don't think that's what's happening here. But, but to explain what is happening here, what I want to do is I want to give you what I'm going to call um, four stages of resignation or uh, appreciation for the righteousness of God. Okay, this is how it happens. Now, I'm not saying that everybody goes through these four stages. I'm not trying to set up like a, a new ordo salutis or something like that. But a lot of us go through these stages as we're trying to understand God's righteous judgment, how it works in our lives, okay? So four stages, here we go. Pay attention to this. The first stage is the lowest stage. This is the, this is the sinner, for sure. The sinner, he looks out at his life. He looks out at the world, all around him. And he says, well, my goodness, God must be unjust. If there is a God, he's an unjust God. He must be wicked and cruel to allow the things that I experience in my life. If there is a God at all, he must be an unjust God because he treats me like this, right? And the wicked person obviously considers himself to be the standard of righteousness. That's how they judge everybody else. And so when bad things, terrible things happen in their own life, they assume that it's God who is unjust and that they themselves are the one who is just. That's the first stage. It's the lowest stage. You don't want to be there, by the way. That's a miserable life. You want to get out of stage one. What is stage two? Well, stage two is when you finally get a real glimpse of yourself. And what you realize in stage two is that God is just to condemn me as a sinner. Okay? In stage two, whether it's the law of God or whether it's the, the mounting feeling of shame and guilt in your life, at some point, you have to get out of blaming God as an unjust God. He is not. And you have to move to, the, to, the, to an understanding of the fact that God would be just to condemn you. He would. If God were to send you to hell right now, he would be just and right to do it. That's part of the gospel. 
Amen? Y'all are pretty quiet about that point, yeah? So, uh, so the second stage is understanding God would be just if he were to condemn me. Third stage, God would be gracious to save me. If I were to be saved, it would be because God is a gracious, merciful, kind, and compassionate God. Here is light streaming into the heart now. Here we are now apprehending not only God's justice, but also his grace. And it's true. If any of us here in this room is going to be saved, it's because God is a merciful, kind, gracious, and compassionate God. That's the only way any of us are going to be saved. It's through the cross of Christ and his blood. That's the third stage. Well, here's what happens, though, is people stall out here. I've, I've observed this. People stall out in the third stage. And that's when they start rationalizing. And they start saying things like, you know, everyone deserves a second chance. But is that true? Does everyone deserve a second chance? Because when you stall out in phase three, all of a sudden you start kind of, kind of rationalizing things away. And grace isn't so gracious anymore. When you start talking about the fact that people deserve grace, you're no longer in the category of grace. Does that make sense? And so what do we do when we stall out? We, well, we start philosophizing. Well, maybe we start rationalizing things with a little bit of uh, like Pelagian free will, a little bit of Arminian free will. Uh, we start talking about some hypothetical universalism. If you don't know what any of those terms mean, by the way, come to Wednesday night Bible study. That's what we do on Wednesday nights is go over that kind of stuff. We start rationalizing things away. And then all of a sudden, like the person gets a little bit confused about what grace and justice actually mean. But hopefully, you break in finally to stage four. Now, stage four is a total and complete acceptance of the grace and the justice of God. This is when you have fully resigned that God is God and everything that he, he does is, is right and true. He's always righteous. He never makes mistakes, right? God's judgment is so perfect that there is no fault in it whatsoever. And it's only here in stage four that you can actually say what the Bible says here in verse 3, once more they cried out, Alleluia, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. That's not a statement of one's hatred in this world spilling over into eternity. What that is, is stage four acceptance of the fact that everything that God does is pure and righteous and true all the time, even in heaven and even in hell. You want to live in stage four. That is complete trust in the perfection of God. That's Julian of Norwich, though I disagree with her in many ways, saying, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things will, shall be well. You want to get there. Complete resignation and the perfection of God's judgments. Okay? That's the second hallelujah. Now let's go on to the third. And we will finish up shortly, but not quite yet. The third hallelujah here is in verse 4. And the 24 elders... And the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen and Alleluia. Now the context here of the third Hallelujah is actually a scene that we've seen before in Revelation. Once again, we're looking at this pairing of the elders, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures who fall down. Now where have we met the elders and the creatures before? Um... We met them way back in Revelation chapter 4. I remember the day that I preached on this because that was the day that the power was out. Do you remember that day? It's a long time ago now. And uh, I don't think we recorded that one because we didn't have any electricity in the building and it was a little bit cold that day. Remember that day? That's the day we preached on this. Let's go back and just refresh our memories on who these living creatures are because they're kind of interesting here. Go back to Revelation chapter 4. Bible's flipping backwards here. Revelation chapter 4. And let's pick it up in verse 6. Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around. Isn't that weird? And within and day and night 
they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Isn't it bizarre, these creatures, how they're described as having eyes all over their bodies? Isn't that weird? It's kind of weird, isn't it? Why is that? Well, if you could, if you could go back to that message, and unfortunately, I don't think we have a recording of it, one of the things that we said about those eyes all over the angels' bodies is that it, it has something to do with perspective, seeing. If you have one eye, you can see a straight line. If you have two, you can get perspective. You can get attack on a particular object. You can see depth perception. This is why when a boxer has an eye that swells up, they usually stop the fight. It's not fair anymore. You have to have perspective to be able to see punches coming at you. But these angels, they have eyes all over. Why is that? Is it because they're weird creatures? No, it's, the Bible is saying something about their perspective. They have knowledge. They have fuller depth and perspective of knowledge now that they are in eternity than we have here in this life. We very often see much of what happens around us is quite two-dimensional and very opaque. But these creatures, you see, they are crying out day and night, glory to God and holy, 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 because they have a true real, eternal perspective on the greatness and the majesty of God. There's not even a hint that God might possibly be unjust or that his plan wouldn't be perfect. They completely have resolved trust in the goodness of God. And herein, here we go, breaks in this auditory revelation now where John is once again going to hear something. Look at this. So the creatures are falling down. There's the third alleluia in verse 4, right? But then in verse 5, we hear this voice from the throne. A voice from the throne came saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Question. Who's speaking in verse 5? Is it the creatures? I don't think so. Yeah, is it, is it the elders? I don't think so. It's from the throne. Who is sitting on the throne? The Lord Christ. Yes, exactly. We saw him be enthroned in chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, remember this great scene uh, where there's, there's some kind of consternation and, and they're wondering who is it that has the authority to open up the seals? Well, in chapter 5 verse 7 it says, And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, right? And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, and they were praying the prayers, which are the prayers of the saints. So, so the lamb is with the father on the throne, and here in, in verse 5, what we have here is Christ, and he is imploring his people, to join him in this great praise. Notice, praise our God. Isn't that interesting? That Christ would, would say, our God. Just as he says, our Father who art in heaven in the Lord's Prayer. Here, what Christ is doing is he's, he's, he's uh, imperatively summoning all of the people of God to join in this great, magnificent time of praise. And let's just take a moment to look at what he says here, because we're going to close with this. Praise our God, all you his servants. Is that you? You a servant? I hope so. Uh, that's what Christians do. That's what we are called to do, is we're called to serve the great and living God. Not, not only by our worship, and not excluding that though, but certainly even the way that we serve, even right now in this life, the people all around us and the needs of a hurting and broken world, broken world. You who fear him, that, that's not like Adam and Eve were afraid and they jumped in the bushes and hid from God. This kind of a fear of God is that adoring reverence that we have for the king. Yes? And what does he say? You who fear him small and great. Are you small before the Lord? Perfect. You'll fit in just fine. And he will show you how great is his mercy to you. Are you great in the eyes of men? Then fine. 
he will show you how small you must be in your own eyes to come to him in repentance and faith. Um, We'll end here for this week, and next week when we gather together, we're going to look at this beautiful text, the marriage supper of the Lamb. For now, though,